Uh, sister Deloris, are you there? To pray for us. Can you pray for us? Good morning. Good morning. Yes, I'm here. Good okay. morning. Good morning. Can you, can you pray for us, Sister Deloris? Okay. Our kind and ever loving Father, we want to thank you for allowing us to see another beautiful morning. As we are awake, Lord, we can hear the lovely singing of the birds on the outside. We can also hear the voices that is online this morning. As we are about to go through our study, Father, I ask you to encamp around us and help us to understand what we are, what you are about to feed us. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Sister Dawn, what, what I will do, I, I will mute everyone and then you will be able to unmute yourself, okay? Okay. Okay. Just give me one, two seconds, sister. Okay, what I will do, uh, I think this is the brother might want to join in singing, so we'll do it after. Okay. Nope. Yes. And we're going at Faith of Our Fathers, 304. Faith of Our Fathers, let him stand in spite of dungeons, fire, and soul. Oh, how our hearts beat high with joy when we hear that glorious word. Faith of our Father's holy faith, we will be through to the end. Our Father's chain in prison down, we're still in heart and conscience free. How sweet would be the children's faith. If they like them, could die for thee. Faith of our Father's holy faith, we will be true to thee till then. Faith of our Father's we will love. Both friends and foe in all of strife and preach thee to us, love us now. By candy with and faith is life. Faith of our Father's holy faith, we will be true to thee, the land. Amen. Amen. Everyone, we need the cross of Jesus, tree or tree? Yeah. We need the cross of Jesus, I faint will take my stand. The shadows of a mighty rock within a weary land. A home within the wilderness, a rest upon the way. From the burning of the noontime and the burden of the day. Upon the cross of Jesus, mine eyes at times can see the very dying form of one who suffered there for me. And from my smitten heart, with tears to wonders I confess. The wonders of redeeming love and my unworthiness. I think the cross of Jesus 
Jesus, should I have a song? In the morning when I rise, in the morning when I rise, in the morning when I rise, give me Jesus. Give me Jesus, give me Jesus. You may have all of this. Give me Jesus. Dark midnight was my cry. Dark midnight was my cry. Dark midnight was my cry. Oh, give me Jesus. Oh, give me Jesus. Give me Jesus. You may have all this world. Give me Jesus. Just about the break of day, just about the break of day, just about the break of day, give me Jesus, give me Jesus, give me Jesus, you may have all of this world. Give me Jesus. Oh, when I come to die. Oh, when I come to die. Oh, when I come to die. Give me Jesus. Oh, give me Jesus. Give me Jesus. Give me Jesus. Amen. 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 my king only my sin now contrite grant 
me the cleansing thy blood doth impart. Grant me the cleansing thy blood doth impart. Hear us the nearer, Lord, to be done. Sin with the sorrows, I gladly resign. All of his pleasure, from turn its cry. Give me what Jesus my Lord crucified, give me but Jesus, my Lord crucified. Nearer, still nearer, while I shall live, safe in glory. My uncle is gone. Through endless ages, ever to be nearer, my Savior, still nearer to be nearer, my Savior, still nearer to be. Amen. Two eighty six. Two eight six. Two eight six. Sing them over again to me, wonderful words of life. Let me more of a beauty see. Wonderful words of life, words of life and beauty. Teach me faith and beauty. Beautiful words, wonderful words, wonderful words of life. Beautiful words, wonderful words, wonderful words of life. Sorry. Christ, the blessed one, gives to all wonderful words of life. Oh, send all this to the loving God, wonderful words of life. All so freely given, who went us to heaven. Beautiful words, wonderful words, wonderful words of life. Beautiful words, wonderful words, wonderful words of life. Then I listen to the loving call, wonderful words of life. Offer pardon and peace to all, wonderful words of life. Jesus, the Holy Savior, sanctify forever. Beautiful words, wonderful words, wonderful words of life. Beautiful words. Wonderful words, wonderful words of life. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Indeed, those wonderful words of life. Good morning to all. Brother Elijah. Good morning, Sister Don. This moment, God has a lot to do. It's yours now. Huh? This moment that God has a lot to do is yours now. Okay, let me just mute everyone uh, before we start. Okay, go ahead, Brother Elijah. Unmute yourself. Well, good morning, everyone. 
and uh, so blessing to be oh blessing to be here were there any questions or comments uh concerning what we were discussing last night um I would like to go over the storehouse. Okay. Always, um, what portion? Now, first of all, portion, when, okay. if you notice when we were talking about the storehouse, uh, if, we, if we find the storehouse in the spirit of prophecy and if we find the storehouse in the new testament we were supposed to find the storehouse where the first five books first five books and when we found out that the storehouse was really associated more so with silver and gold and dollar bills or uh, the storehouse was really associated more so with who with God. With God, but with who? With us. See, we were supposed to be, we came from God's what? Storehouse. Mm -hmm. And that's why he says, I will make a man more precious than what? Silver or gold. Yeah. Mm -hmm. In the beginning, so we never. We never, uh, I had never thought about it like that. And, um, and when I began to really understand the storehouse, because remember, in Egypt, Joseph was commanded by God to build what? Bonds. Yeah, bonds or storehouses to store up the grain for the people. So therefore, that's why when we understand uh, in Leviticus 23rd chapter, we understand the, the purpose of the harvest. In essence, when you, uh, most of us, most of us are not really uh, involved anymore in agriculture, we have growing food and so forth like that. And it says when you grow your food, be ever what it was. It was the purpose to store the seeds for the next year's planting, correct? Yes. Yeah. And you would bring and you you would store the best seeds so that you could plant again next year so that you'd have a a, a good crop. Yeah. And and see, and this is where uh we understand that's why when when Christ was resurrected, why did he not? Uh, why did he not take himself to the earthly uh, storehouse? Why did he not take himself? Go go over there. Go over there, Sister uh, Sister Dawn. Go go look at Leviticus twenty three, eight, nine, and eleven. But he shall offer an offering made by fire unto the Lord seven days. In the seventh day, it's an holy invocation. He shall do no servile work therein. And mm -hmm. the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel and say unto them. When you come into the land which I gave unto you, and shall reap the harvest thereof, then you shall bring a sheaf of the first fruits of your harvest unto the priest. Okay. And you shall give the sheaf before the Lord to be accepted for you on the morrow after the Sabbath, the priest shall reap it. Okay, now notice here the instructions were that the first fruits were to be uh, brought to who? It's supposed to the priest to the, to the temple. Okay, now why when Christ, we know he was the first fruits, right? Yeah. Why did he not present himself to Caiaphas 
after his resurrection. Because Caiaphas disqualified himself as the high priest. Why? Because he, he tore his he tore his robe. He was not supposed to do that. Thank you. Okay, why did he not present himself to the Lord at the temple? Hmm? What happened in, happened in 605 BC? Oh, so, yeah, I was going to say that, but I wasn't too sure. So that was it. There was no uh, ark. Uh, the ark was not there. The ark was not there. Was not there. Remember, yeah. Christ told him, Your house is left unto you. What? Desolate. Desolate, okay. I mean, the Jewish brothers had really got so into rituals. And the priest was so into rituals that even though there was no ark behind the veil, they still chose to believe. Because remember, when the high priest went behind the veil on the Day of Atonement, and he came out alive. See, there's a concept that says he had a rope on his feet or whatever, you know, but there is no such thing was allowed. If the high priest went in there with something on him, arrayed in something, he was struck down because when it came to worship, you could not add or do what, Sister Dawn? Or subtract, right? Take away, yeah. No had to go in exactly the way that God says do it, that this thing about rituals is a very powerful thing with us because when the high priest went behind the veil and came out from behind the veil, that was a sign that what, what about Israel? God's presence wasn't there. Yeah, God's presence wasn't there. But when that, when the high priest went behind the veil and came out alive, then that was, that was a sign that there was no what in Israel. The Holy Spirit wasn't there. No, there was no sin in Israel. Come on. See, if there was, if there was sin in Israel, this is how serious they took the Day of Atonement. If there was sin in Israel, if anybody in Israel has sin in their life, then that high priest was supposed to be struck down. You know that. Yeah. So when the high priest went behind the veil and came out, he came out and proclaimed that there was no what in Israel? No sin. No sin. So now you understand why the people really love Caiaphas now, okay? Caiaphas was coming back and telling the people, you are a holy and sinless what? People. And Jesus was coming and telling them, you are a vile and what kind of people? Wretched people. <laughs> Which one would you want to accept and believe, Sister Dawn? The Holy Priest told me. Thank you. That's why you see now why God tore the veil, correct? On what day was the veil torn, Sister Sister Dawn? On the 14th day. Of what month? On the first month. At Eve. Now, at Eve. He, he the veil on the 14th day of the first month at Eve. Now, a new veil was supposed to be uh the veil in the sanctuary was replaced on what day? Uh, not every year. Uh, at, right at the at the at the close of the Day of Atonement. Okay. Yeah. So at the close of the Day of Atonement, a new veil was supposed to be put up there because remember the veil for that year 
what did it have on it? Blood, just stained with blood. blood. Right. So at the close of the Day of Atonement, a new veil was replaced, okay? Now, God had intended that the veil was to be remain torn until what? The day, of, the day of Atonement, correct? Okay. Not know. Right. So, and this was supposed to be a lesson for the people, but do you know that those who were responsible for the veil, the high priest, violated even that? He replaced that what? The veil. He replaced the veil. He replaced the veil before it was supposed to be replaced. Okay. So the, the people in deception. Oh yes, yes. Mm -hmm. Now, now one other question about the tearing of the veil. Remember, go to oh, go over there to uh, Revelation, the fourth chapter. Revelation, the fourth chapter, one. Read that all the way till the end. After this, I looked, and behold, a door was opened in heaven, and the first voice which I heard was, as it were, of a trumpet talking with me, which said, Come up hither, and I will show thee things which must come, which must be hereafter. And immediately I was in the spirit, and behold, a throne was set in heaven, and one set on the throne. Okay, now, now let's start with this part right here. To help us understand Revelation, what we're seeing here, he says, and I beheld, and a, what was open in heaven? A door. What door was this, Sister Dawn? The door to the holy place. Well, let's find out. What to the most holy place. Now, remember now, uh, we see, go over there to... Uh, Go over there to the book, Desire of Ages, the last chapter to my father and your father, last two pages. The last two pages. Yeah, yes, I got it. Notice what it says here. Uh, all heaven awaits. All heaven was waiting to welcome the Savior to the celestial courts. Wait a minute now. All heaven waiting to... Welcome to... the Savior to the celestial courts. Okay, then to the celestial courts. Is this the celestial courts of the city? Or is this talking about the court? Is or is this talking about the holy place? You just said the holy place. Which one? Which one, Sister Don? Thinking. <laughs> I mean, evidently what you said doesn't line up with what the angels are waiting to. Welcome the Savior to what? The holy place. It didn't say the holy place, because see, the holy place is not the what? The court, celestial court. So, so according to the spirit of prophecy, he went to the what? Celestial what? Courts. Courts, okay. Now, the courtyard was different from the holy place and most holy place, okay? So notice what it says, all heaven was waiting to welcome the Savior to the celestial court. Because he remember, when he returns to heaven, he returns to heaven in what year? 8031. And the holy place was not supposed to be open until what year? 82. 80 what? 34. 34. Yes, it is right. right. Okay, now all heaven is waiting to to welcome the Savior to the celestial court. Keep on going. 
as he ascended, he led the way, and then much captives set free at his resurrection followed. Okay, now notice here, as he ascends, he's taking what with him, Sister Dawn? Those who were resurrected with him. He's taking the harvest, the barley harvest, back to, to, to where? To heaven with him. To the... Celestial to the, the what? To the, to, the, to the storehouse, right? So the barley harvest, he's taking them back to the storehouse, okay? If you notice, he did not take them to the earthly storehouse, which was supposed to be a shadow. Because remember, everything that occurred in Jerusalem was supposed to be a shadow of the less of, of heaven, correct? Yes. So right. what you're saying is that um, what they were doing, like you know, when they said go out, it had the barley harvest represents the first fruits. Right. Like right, right. So the first grain to come up was called the uh it's it's called the barley. Now where do we find that in the first five books? In Leviticus. Right, but you also find it in Exodus, okay? No, I also find it there. Of course you do. <laughs> no, 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 no. I didn't, I didn't hear this now. Huh? No, I didn't hear your last word this now. Yeah, you find it, you also find it in uh, in uh, Exodus. Yeah. Now keep on reading that. And I'll, I'll get, I'll, I'll find the text in Exodus for you, okay? Okay. As he ascended, he led the way, and the multitude of captives set free at his resurrection followed. The heavenly host, with shoots, with shouts and acclamation of praise and celestial song, attended the joyous tree. As they drew near to the city of God, the challenge is given by the escorting angel. Lift up your heads, O ye gates and be lift up your everlasting doors, and the king of glory shall come in. Now, wait Joyce a minute. Now, Sister Dawn, I know this. He's it's not saying lift up your head, ye everlasting gate, one, but it's saying now lift up your head, ye everlasting what? Gates more Gates. than one now, okay? Yeah. yeah, is that not true, Sister Don? Yes, it is. And yeah. be lift up your everlasting doors. Now, in yeah. Revelation 4 chapters, we see one door open, but now we see many doors. What open? Why is this, Sister Don? Because this is in New Jerusalem here with the 12 gates. Very good. And we find the 12 gates in the first five books of the Bible. Where do we find the 12 gates in the first five books of the Bible? Huh? 12 gates. <laughs> Remember, what, what, is it, what is on the 12 gates? The name of the 12? The 12, the 12, the 12 um, Right. See, the 12 tribes was supposed to be a shadow or a type of the 12 gates, okay? So you find the 12 gates there, okay? I didn't know this stuff either, Sister Don, because I'd never studied this before, because, you know, I was told that that's not salvific, okay? <laughs> so the 12 tribes was a shadow or a type of the 12 gates, okay? okay? Now, now, keep going. Joyfully the waiting sentinels respond, who is this king of glory? Now, wait a minute. When he's going back, now notice what role and what duties does he have to fulfill? Who is the what? Is it saying who is the priest of glory or is it saying of glory? 
He's a king of, who is this king of glory? So is, he's going to the celestial courts to take up his duties and responsibility as the what? King. King of kings. Okay. As the king, he's got to fulfill. If you read in the spirit of prophecy, it says Adam was appointed as king of this planet, okay? Yes. All right, keep going. This they say, not because they know not who he is, but because they will hear the, the answer of exalted praise. The Lord strong and mighty, the Lord mighty in battle. Why do they say the Lord strong and mighty, the Lord mighty in battle? Because he conquered, he conquered. Conquered who? He conquered Lucifer. And right. Remember, Lucifer had boasted to all the angelic hosts and to all the worlds that should Christ truly become a human being, what would happen to him? He would be the king of this earth. <laughs> that, yeah. Lucifer said, every human being that has come into existence on this planet, he had defeated them, you and I included. So he said, there is no way I can what? Get a load up. I can lose. Mm. If Christ become a human being, he, Lucifer says, my record is a billion wins and zero what? Losses. Because every man had sinned. So he says, when Jesus comes, I'm going to continue my undefeated what? My undefeated record, okay? Because every human being from Adam all the way down to the time Christ came into the world, Lucifer had defeated, okay? Yeah. His, rec his record was what, Sister, Sister Dawn? All wins and no losses. Humanity, Lucifer, a billion. Humanity, how what? Zero. Yeah. So he said, basically, I'm going to defeat him too. Okay, keep going. Again, it's heard the challenge. Who is this king of glory? For the angels never weary of hearing his name exalted. The, exalt, the exalted angels make reply, the Lord of hosts, he is the king of glory. Psalms 24, 7 to 10. Then the portals of the gate of the city of God are open wide. And now, wait, why strong. does this say that the portals of the city of God are open wide? The portals are opening, so everything is... Remember, the spirit of prophecy says each one of the portals have an angel standing by the gate. And yes. the angel... And you have sentinels standing at the gates of the new Jerusalem. And each one of the angels that enter into the city has to have a what? Have a book. Remember, have to have a golden card? Yeah, a golden card. To get into the city, okay? Yeah. So in the book of Job, we see Lucifer come into that meeting up in heaven with the sons of God. Where is that meeting going to be? Where was that meeting when Lucifer went up there in the book of Job, Sister Dawn? It was outside. Outside. Thank you. When, when Job, in the book of, uh, in the book of, where, in the book where it was talking about uh, Lot, when the angels came to Sodom and Gomorrah where did Lot meet the angels? Oh, Inside so just... of the city? Oh, ah. Yeah. And Lot was one of the elders of the city. Yes. See, it was the responsibility when you came to the city, you had a gate at the city you would be examined by who? The elder. 
to determine whether or not you were worthy to come into the what? And that's why then after they determined whether or not you were worthy, then they gave you the what to the city? Uh, the key, the key to the city. <laughs> key to the city. Ah, then the city gates were open because you had the what to the city? I have the key. <laughs> Thank you. And this had to be approved by the elders of the city, okay? Yeah. Okay. Now keep reading. Then the portals of the city of God are opened wide, and the angelic trunks sweep to the gates amid a burst of rapturous music. There is a throne, and around it the rainbow of promise. Now notice there what it says. Seraphim, then the seraphim. gate, then the gates of the city are open wide. Yes. Did it say the gates to the temple are open wide or the gates to the what? City city is the city and the temple one and the same no can't be the same no Thank you because when you went to jerusalem over there when you went through the gate you didn't step automatically into the holy place okay yeah the, the temple was located at a certain place in the city you had jerusalem and then you had Moriah, and, and the temple was located on Moriah, okay? Now the city was built around the temple, okay? Around the, and it was on the Temple Mount. That's why it's called the Temple Mount, okay? So in the city of Jerusalem, you had this little mount called the Temple Mount, and that's where the, the temple was located, okay? Keep on reading, Sister Dawn. There is a throne and around it the rainbow of promise. There are cherubim and seraphim. The commanders of the angel hosts, the sons of God, the representatives of the unfallen worlds are assembled. So who are these representatives of the unfallen worlds? Maybe the 24 elders. You are correct. Keep on going. The heavenly council, before which Lucifer had accused God and his son, the representatives of those sinless realms over which Satan had taught to establish his dominion, all are there to welcome the Redeemer. They are eager to celebrate his triumph and to glorify their king. Mm -hmm. But he waves them back. Not yet. He cannot now receive the coronet of glory and the royal robe. Wait a minute. Now, wait a minute. Now, he cannot yet receive the what? The coronet of glory and the royal robe. All right. Why? Because he didn't go to his father's yet. Now, notice what he does next. He enters into the presence of his father. He points to his wounded head, the pierced side, the marred feet. He lifts his hands, bearing the print of nails. He points to the tokens of his triumph. He presents to God the wave sheaf, those raised with him as representatives of the great multitude who shall come forth from the grave at his second coming. So those that he took back to heaven with him in 31 AD, they represent what, Sister Dawn? The first fruits of those who were resurrected. Thank you. They to us are a sign and a token of the fact that you and I have to be translated or resurrected. They cannot, you cannot take uh, disease infected grain and put it in the where? No, house. The storehouse. Because if you put infected or diseased grain to the storehouse, what is it going to do with the other grain? It's going to contaminate all, destroy all. Thank you. 
That's why, remember the spirit of prophecy said God, once he kicked, put Lucifer out of the new Jerusalem, he says, I cannot allow you back into the storehouse because if I allow you back in, you will infect what? Everyone. You will infect everyone, Lucifer. Okay, keep reading. He approaches the Father, with whom there is joy over one sinner that repents, who rejoices over one with singing. Before the foundations of the earth were laid, the Father and the Son had united in a covenant to redeem man if he should become to be overcome by Satan. They have clasped their hands in a solemn pledge that Christ should become the surety for the human race. This pledge of Christ was fulfilled. When, when upon the cross he cried out, it is finished. He addressed the Father. The compact had been fully carried out. Now he declares, Father, it is finished. I have done thy will, O my God. I have completed the work of redemption. If thy justice is satisfied, I will that they also, whom thou hast given me, be with me where I am. John 19, 30, 17, 24. The voice of God is heard proclaiming that justice is satisfied. Satan is vanquished. Christ is toiling, struggling. Ones on earth are accepted to the in the beloved. Ephesians 1, 6. Before the heavenly angels and the representatives of the unfallen worlds, they are declared justified. Where he is, there his church shall be. Mercy and truth are met together. Righteousness and peace are, have kissed each other. Psalms 85, 10. The father's arms encircle his son and the word is given. Let all the angels of God worship him. Hebrews 1, 6. With joy unutterable, rulers and principalities and powers acknowledge the supremacy of the prince of life. Uh -huh. Go ahead. The angel hosts prostrate themselves before him, while the glad shout fills all the courts of heaven. Worthy the lamb that was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. Revelation 5, 12. Songs of triumph mingle with music from angel harps till heaven seemed to overflow with joy and praise. Love has conquered. The loss is found. Heaven rings with voices in lofty strains proclaiming blessing and honor and glory and power be unto him that sitteth upon the throne and unto the Lamb forever and ever. Revelation 5, 13. Okay. From that scene of heaven, from that scene of heavenly joy, there comes back to us on earth the echo of Christ's own wonderful words. I ascend unto my Father and your Father and to my God and your God. The family of heaven and the family of earth are one. For us, our Lord ascended, and for us he lives. Wherefore, he is able also to save them to the uttermost that come unto God by him, seeing he ever liveth to make intercession for them. It's the Lord. It is wonderful. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Now, go over there to verse 9.31. Um, before you go there, before we go there, I just want to, um, what I recognize here is that um, with the 24 elders, people was, were debating if it was those who were resurrected with Christ and so on. So you have to make a decision. No, no, no. Alice was making a point. That what people yes. will say, but now I'm seeing it in the spirit of prophecy, it, I clearly identified who they are. Yeah. You see, we've taken the position that the fallen churches have taken. If you go to a lot of the theological schools and concepts, they, the fallen churches basically teach that the 24 elders are the, those that were resurrected with Christ. And he took them back to heaven. But see, the spirit of prophecy tells us that the, those that were taken back to heaven with Christ are emblematic of the wave sheaf, right? Yes. 
And if you notice, <clears throat> go over there to uh, Exodus. I think it's Exodus 4. Exodus 4.22. And thou shalt say unto Pharaoh, Thus say the Lord, Israel is my son, even my firstborn. Mm -hmm. Now, is that 4.22? Uh, oh. yeah. <laughs> well, we'll go, go to Exodus 9.31 first. And the flax and the barley were smitten, for the barley was in the air, and the flax was boiled. Now notice what was smitten? The flax and the barley. Okay, and it tells you what one, what one, what was in the air? The barley was in the air. Right, but the flax, then read four and five. Of the same 31? Yeah. I mean, of, and, of, of verse nine, uh, of chapter nine, nine? Read nine, 30, and 31, because, well. Okay. So it tells, that, you, tells you about the barley. That chapter nine, verse 30 and 31. Mm -hmm. But as for thee and thy servants, I know that thee shall not fear the Lord God. And the flax and the barley was smitten, for the barley was in the air, and the flax was boiled. Mm -hmm. Now notice what it says about the barley. The barley was ready, was what? Was in the air. So the was when they made that unleavened bread, barley. Barley. they made it out of what? Barley. Right. Because you remember, the flax and the barley was in the air, but remember when the when the plague fell, it fell on Egypt, or did it fall on the children of Israel and go? It plague fell on, on the on the Egyptians, because the because people uh, were protected. But it didn't fall on the children of Israel in Goshen, so they were able to go out and harvest the what? Which one? The barley. Thank you. And that's what they made their unleavened bread out of the bark because it was in the ear. But what did it say about the other one? And the flax was boiled, B O L L E D. Right. But the flax was not ready yet. Yes. Had not got to the ear yet. Okay. Yeah. All right. So that's that that see, so that lets you know what the feast of the unleavened bread was all about. It was made out of barley. Okay. okay. Now remember later on when the other grain comes into ear, you would make that would have to deal with what part of the sanctuary? Um, the, holy, the holy place. Thank you, because in the holy place on the table of showbread, you every seven days the bread was changed. So you could have flax on the table of showbread, you could have rye, you could have oats, depending upon where you were in the you know, in the planting of the grain, okay? Okay. But when the Passover occurred, you knew that the Passover surrounded the barley. What? Barley, only barley, yes. Only the barley, okay? Only the barley harvest. Now, two weeks later, you might have the flax harvest. And two weeks later, well, every seven days or whatever, then you would have something other harvest on the table of showbread. And remember, yes. the table of showbread was changed every seven days up until you got to the day of what? Atonement. Thank you. Okay. Mm -hmm. now, so, so therefore, 
So therefore you see why this is important with the spirit of prophecy. So when you go in there, go back now, let's go back over to uh, Revelation, the fourth chapter. Okay. Continue reading from Revelation 4. Yeah, uh-huh. And, he's, he's, and he that sat was to look upon like a jasper and a sardine stone. And there was a rainbow round about the throne, in sight like unto an emerald. And round about the throne were four and twenty seats. And upon the seats I saw four and twenty elders sitting, clothed in white raiment. Okay, now, now notice, Sister Dawn, take it very slowly. So first of all, a door was open in heaven. And it doesn't say doors or gates. What door is this talking about? That's what's open in heaven. Okay, now if you want to find out about the door being open in heaven, you have to go back over to, to what book? Where? Big controversy. No, you have to go back over to the first what? Oh, yes, the first five books. <laughs> you know, you'll get it into your mouth, you'll get it into your head sooner or later. It took me a while to, to, to accept it too. So if I want to find out about a door or doors, I have to go back to the first five what? Books. Books. Now notice it says, and I... And I read what read Revelation 4 1 again. What does it say there, Sister Dawn? After this, I looked, and behold, a door was open in heaven. And the first voice which I heard was, as it were, of a trumpet talking with me. Which oh, said, how many, how many trumpets? One. Now let's go over to Numbers, the 10th chapter, and find out what am I supposed to understand when I hear a trumpet, one trumpet. Go ahead. Numbers 10. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Make thee two trumpets of silver. Of a whole piece shalt thou make them, that thou mayest use them now for what, the what are the these sun. two trumpets of silver all about? That's a call the people to assembly. It was also for warning. Okay, now whenever we see trumpets in Revelation, it has something to do with what? Therefore, these, no, these trumpets, trumpets that you're reading here, okay? Over the, there was the Aaron's sons would blow the what? The trumpets. So, Blow how many trumpets? One or two trumpets? Two trumpets come for the Passover. Notice, read, read it again. Read the beginning again. What does it say, Sister Dawn? And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Make thee two trumpets of silver, of mm -hmm. whom thee shall thou make them, that thou mayest use them for the calling of the assembly and for the children of the, of the camps. Okay. And when they so, shall blow with them, all the assembly shall assemble themselves to be. Oh, the the now you understand. Now you. But Elijah, you in and out. Over there too. You remember trumpets. You when you have the feast of trumpets. Go ahead. So, so notice in notice in Revelation four we see how many trumpets just the dawn one. Keep on reading. So numbers tell us what we are to expect when we see when we hear one trumpet. Okay, go ahead. And if they blow with one trumpet, no, no, no. And when they shall blow with them, all the assembly shall assemble themselves to be at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. And if they blow with one trumpet, 
Then the princes, which are the heads of thousands of Israel, shall gather themselves unto thee. Thank you. Now, remember now, in Revelation 4, we see one door open because who is going to respond to that one door being open, Sister Dawn? The heads of the, the heads. The heads. Who is the head of this earth, Sister Dawn? Who is the elder of this earth? It was supposed to be Adam, but he sold it out. He sold it out to Lucifer. Yes. Then Lucifer in the book of Job went there because Lucifer heard what in heaven? He heard a trumpet. Ah, now you got it, Sister Dawn. <laughs> and he went there as the elder of this what? This earth. Now, when he got there, guess who was already there? Christ was already there. No, no, no. The other what? The other elders. Yes, because when the one trumpet sounds, not only does the elder from this planet comes, the elder from where? Oh, the other planet, the other worlds, the other worlds. Uh-huh. But when Lucifer got there, Sister Don, something strange happened. He saw 24 what there, Sister Don? Elders. But no, before they got to the elders, he saw 24 what? What did it say in Revelation, the fourth chapter? There is the throne, and around the throne of 24 a what? A rainbow of promise. Huh? A rainbow of promise. And, on. and 24 seats. No, wait, wait a minute. What comes first, the seats or the elders, the dawn? The seats. Oh. So when Lucifer gets there, he sees the Father's throne, and he sees 24 what? Elders sitting on the throne, sitting on the seats. They're not sitting on the throne yet. You see, 24 what? Elders seated or seated. No. What does he see first? The throne and you see 24 what? Seats. But, but notice he doesn't see a what for who? A seat for him. He doesn't see a seat for him. Oh, why? Because remember, the elder of this planet was supposed to see that where? In one of those seats. Mm -mm. Jesus says, I will sit down on whose throne? His, his father's throne. Oh, that's why you don't see 25, what? Elder. <laughs> no, tw not elders, 25 seats. I'm getting confused. <laughs> No, no. When you go there, you have the Father's throne, and then you have 24 thrones around the Father's throne, right? Yes. Then the elders, they don't stay there permanently. They are all taking care of their duties and responsibilities. On. As the trumpet is sounded, then the Elders come from their planets, solar systems, these are wherever they are. They come to assemble, to assemble. Thank you. That's why you see the first and see the elder. What? After. Thank you. But see, it's strange when it gets to the meeting, all of the have their what? Seats. Have their throne. But Lucifer doesn't have a what? Throne. Because guess what? And that was a, a prophecy or indicative of the fact that Lucifer, you're going to be cast out in the future, okay? Yeah. There was no what for him? No tune for him. And and guess what? 
he could not shut down on who what? What's Jordan? Oh, he couldn't do that. So Lucifer is in a fix, okay? Hmm. Everybody else is sitting on a what? Jordan. And Lucifer is standing up there and he has no what? No throne. <laughs> no throne, okay. Because remember, later on, it says, you just read it, it says with Christ, when he returns from this planet, he went into the presence of what? His father. When Lucifer went to those council meetings, could he go into the presence of the what? Father. No, he couldn't. <sighs> okay, now. So, so you see the thrones first, and then you see the elders. So evidently, when the trumpet was sounded, the elders heard that, heard those trumpets wherever they were in God's vast universe, okay? That's why when Christ was walking with the disciples and all of a sudden we see him being taken up is that he heard the what? Trumpet. He heard the trumpet, okay? So you were correct, Sister Dawn. The 24 elders are not the what? Those who were resurrected when Christ died. Right. Mm -hmm. So, so basically, now then that takes us back to something else. Uh, when in in Revelation to confirm this, if you have twenty four elders representing this planet in the end, you would also have to have 24 elders where, Sister, Sister Dawn? On earth. Huh? You'd have to have 24 elders in the beginning. There's five books. Yeah, in the first five books, do you have 24 elders representing this planet in the beginning? Uh, when this planet was created, did God create 24 atoms or did he create one atom? One atom. So how many representatives did we have in the beginning? One or did we have 24? Yeah, one because if you have one in the beginning, then you must have one where in the end. So that's so therefore, Sister Dawn, we have a problem. When this planet is recreated over again, hmm. how many elders are you gonna have on this planet? One elder because Adam was the elder. Sister Brenda. Sister Brenda, are you there? Sister Jim. Okay, let me let me read Sister Brenda. Well, then I just hold on. Let me unmute her, sorry. Go ahead and unmute yourself, Sister Brenda, if you're there. Sister Brenda, are you there? Yes, I am. <laughs> Good to hear your voice. Okay, Sister Brenda. Yes. According to the Bible, when God created this planet, you had one elder or two elders? One. So after the thousand years, when Christ comes back here to this earth, the planet is going to be 
created over new, then he's going to take all of the grain out of the storehouse and plant us in his garden here, right? Yes. That's after he gets rid of the rocks and the stones. And you remember he was talking about the different soils, okay? So okay. he's got to make the soil just right for Brenda because, you know, Brenda likes things to be just what? <laughs> That's right. <laughs> <laughs> Want them to be just right, okay? <laughs> okay. Then, Brenda, mm -hmm. we got an issue here. We got Christ as the elder, and who else do we have here on the new earth? We got Adam, right? Yes. So, do we have one elder or two elders? Well, I would say one because Jesus is, was the second Adam. He's the second Adam, then. Now, let's go over to 1 Corinthians, uh, I think it's 1 Corinthians 15, starting just over there, Sister Brendan. Let's find out how many elders we're going to have on the planet, okay? I think it's 1 Corinthians 15, verse starting with 18, 19, 20, 21. Go ahead, read what it says there. That's the second 18, 19, and 20. 18, 18, all the way down to the end. Go ahead. From verse 18, then, um, then they also which are fallen asleep in Christ are perished. If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men most miserable. But now is Christ risen from the dead and become the first fruits of them that slept. Okay, now, sister, now why is this important to understand this here? He's talking about those who fall asleep in Christ. Yes. Now, why, why is it that some who fall asleep in Christ, why did they perish? And why do others come up in the second resurrection sister bread um those who those who perish are, are the ones that are that um well have i did okay sister sister brenda do yes. you know that you and i were supposed to look forward to doing what look forward to I, I didn't quite get what you were saying we are supposed to look forward or look for look forward to to what? being um to look forward to when christ comes um no us. no no something got to happen before he comes okay. you just read about it go to six star with verse 16. Levitic, uh, what you first Corinthians 15, start with verse 16. Okay. For if the dead is, for if the dead rise not, then is not Christ raised. Okay. Oh. Now he says, mm -hmm. so when Jesus, now if you go back to the book Desire of Ages in the chapter called the Passover, it says Jesus went to the temple when he was 12 years old, correct? Yes. And he saw in the slaying of the Passover, he saw his own what? He saw himself, I guess. Like yeah, he, his own what? His... what happened to him? That he, he had to, that he had to do what? Die, right? Die. Yes. So, so from the age of 12, Jesus looked forward to his what? To, to his death. Ah, Sister Brenda, do you know you and I were supposed to look forward to our what? What, death? Of course, Sister Brenda. I, I, didn't, I didn't think so, because nobody wants to die, so. Sister Brenda. Yes. Now. Jesus was without sin 
and he looked forward to his what? To his, to his death. <laughs> Thank you. In fact, he was talking to the disciples about the fact that he was going to what? To die. And the disciples, oh, no, no, no. That's, oh, that's such a morbid subject. We just don't talk about it. Isn't that what they were saying? Yes, they were saying that. But Jesus was trying to set the example before you and me that we should look forward to our what? Our death. Because remember, the wages of sin is what? Death. <laughs> And when you and I are saying, oh, I don't want to die, we're basically saying that we don't deserve to what? Well, we don't deserve to, to, to live. <laughs> no. To <die. laughs> okay. But well, when yes, we don't deserve to die, that's right. Thank you. To pay for the penalty for sin. <laughs> thank you. But see, the penalty we have to take for sin is different than the penalty that he took for sin. What penalty is your sin? What, were, what was the penalty for your sin and my sin, Sister Brenda? For the second death. Oh, Sister Brenda. But he has given you and me a substitute death. What is the mm -hmm. substitute death that you and I have to accept? Go to, okay, go ahead. Go to Psalms 23. Psalms 23. Okay, go Psalms to Psalms 23, which verse? One, two, and three. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Verse four, you want me to continue verse four? Yep. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, <sighs> I will fear no evil. For thou See art... See, the reason why we don't look forward to it is because we fear what? Death. <laughs> no, no, we fear evil. Evil, okay. So notice the Lord is saying, Brenda and Elijah, I must prepare you to walk through the second mm -hmm. death or the shadow of death, Sister Brenda. The shadow of death. But see, we don't actually go to him and says, Lord, I need you to get me ready to walk through the what? The, the shadow of death. And I need you to prepare me not to fear any what? Evil. Because that's, we are scared of the shadow of what? Of death. But see, the reason why we're scared is because we will not submit to him guiding us through the Yes. See, Jesus started at 12 having the Father prepare him to walk into what kind of death? The first death or the second death? The first. Well, no, no, no. no the, sec the second death. <laughs> now, sister, sister Brenda, think about it. He had to be prepared to walk into the second death. And he's saying, Brenda and Elijah, I got to prepare you to walk into the what death? The, the second death. No, no. The first, the first death? The first death, Brenda. See, Jesus took your penalty for the second death, so only mm -hmm. thing you got to be prepared for now is going into the what? Or oh, the first death. Okay, the that's first death. Yeah. Huh? 
Yes, that makes sense. That makes sense. But because we are not going to God, telling him about, well, Lord, uh, this, this first death thing, uh, I really don't want to deal with that, okay? Yes. Lord, uh, when I think about death, it ain't no pleasant thing. And we have to be honest with him, okay? Yes. But since we ain't even talking to him about it, because, Lord, I don't even want to know nothing about no first step. I, I don't want to know nothing. Mm -hmm. All I want to do is live, 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 live. He says, but my child, mm -hmm. he says, Brenda, you must be prepared to face it, okay? Yes. And then, see, Satan wants to keep us in the dark about it. He wants us to pretend that it ain't going to happen. Oh, you ain't going to surely what? Surely die. <laughs> and we really believe, oh, yeah, oh, sure. Yeah, I ain't going to surely die. I ain't going to die. I ain't going to die. So we keep telling ourselves, we ain't going to die. We ain't going to die. As if just telling ourselves that is going to make it what? To make it better. <laughs> make it happen. Rather than us saying, God, this thing called death, it ain't no easy thing to deal with, okay? Yes. And he says, Brenda, I know it's not easy. It's a strange thing. But mm -hmm. I want you to allow me to prepare you to do what? To face that. To go that into the, the because, you, the because remember, Brenda, what kind of disease does Moses die from? Uh, Moses, he, he, I don't know what he, disease he died from. I know he was resurrected, but. Oh, well, it, it, see, then that's why, because Satan don't want us to think about this. Moses didn't have, did he have cancer? Not to my knowledge. Did he have <laughs> no. diabetes? No. Did he have high blood pressure? No. He had a heart attack? No. Did he get hit by a train or a car? No. Did somebody run up there and stick him with a sword or, or, <laughs> or with a spear? No, he just, oh. he just did he, <laughs> did he drown? No. Did he, did somebody hang him? No. Did somebody beat him across the head? <laughs> no. Oh, so one day God told Moses, Moses, the mm -hmm. day you're going to walk through the shadow of what? Death. No disease, no accident, nobody did anything to Moses. Moses walked with God into the shadow of what? Death. Death, okay. Yes. He didn't say, oh Lord, remember? Didn't Moses have a wife, uh, Sister Brenda? Yes, yes, he did. Didn't he have children? Yes, he did. Didn't he have grandchildren? I would suppose so by that time. <laughs> oh, yes, <laughs> he sure did. And when God told him, Moses, today you're going to die. Did he say, do you think he said, I don't want to die, Lord. I got a wife and I got these grandchildren and I got this and I got that. Oh, Lord, please. <laughs> or did he just submit to God and allow him to lead him into the shadow of what? Of death. Yes. Yes. Huh? Yes. <laughs> Okay. And, and most of us, all of us on this line here, you know, we have not allowed God to prepare us to walk through the what? The shadow of death. <laughs> Do we understand what we're, what we're saying, Sister Brenda? Yes, I understand. I understand. Okay. We dread death, okay? We, yeah. oh, we, it's, it's, it, we know it's coming, but oh, Lord, oh, just keep it away from me a little while longer. What? <laughs> yes. I don't even want to think about it, Lord, okay? Mm -hmm. But that's why 
God is saying, I must assist you with this, okay? Yeah. We must go to him and we must ask him, Lord, <laughs> to walk through the shadow of death and to trust you as you lead me into what? Into the shadow of death. Shadow of death, which is called the first sleep, okay? Yes. All right. Now we yes. find the first token of the shadow of death where? Uh, you mean and um up with Christ? No, no, Christ went the second death. Okay. The first the first, I mean from the beginning, um that will have to be um Abel, I guess. Oh you know, the first one to die. Abel, did Abel fuss and holler and scream when Cain when he went into the first what? First death did did he fuss holler and scream fight no thank you okay. and we have to have the same attitude that who had that that, uh, that abel had okay you know. okay all right all right <laughs> <laughs> All right, Sister Dunn, I wanted to ask Sister Brittany those questions about the shadow of death and the first death. Now, when you go back, Sister Dawn, um, and you go over there, the, we found that the, the barley was the, we find that the barley was the first. Now, who was responsible for supervising the killing? of the Passover lamb. Sister, Sister Dawn, excuse me? Was I, who was I examining? examining? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, no, they bring it to the priest. Oh, that's what I thought. Let's go over, let's go over there. Let's go over there. Remember now, when was the priesthood set up? Before or after the children of Israel left Egypt, Sister Dawn? After they left Egypt. No. So mm -hmm. in Egypt, there was no what? <laughs> priesthood. There yes. was no harmonic priesthood when they were in Egypt. Now let's go over there to Exodus 9.31. Exodus 9.31. Okay. And the flax and the barley was smitten. For the barley was in the air and the flax was born. Okay. Now, 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 that's back to the barley. And the barley, now notice... The oh wait wait a minute. that was the wrong text I think it's Exodus four oh go to Exodus four I'm sorry I get, I get... four thirty one no four twenty nine and Moses and Aaron went and gathered together all the elders of the children of Israel mm -hmm. and Aaron spake all the words which the Lord had spoken unto Moses and did the signs in the sight of the people. And the people mm. believed. And when they heard that the Lord had visited the children of Israel, that he had looked upon their affliction, then they bowed their heads and worshipped. Okay. Now, then if you notice, no, Moses goes and gathers the elders. Then notice here, go to Exodus 12, 21. Then Moses called for all the elders of Israel and said unto them, draw out and take you a lamb according to your families and kill the Passover. Oh, so who was responsible for supervising the killing of the Passover lamb in Egypt? The elders. Okay, now. Not the what? Not the priests. 
Thank you. Now, see, after they left Egypt, then that's when the priest was what? How's it? How's it? I commented on That's when the priest was introduced. But when they were in Egypt, who was responsible for making sure that the Passover lamb was correct? The, the elders. elders. The elders. Okay. So the elder has to do his job before the priest can what? Do his job. Now, go all the way back over there. Remember, we were talking about the 24 elders. The elders have to do their job before the priest can start his what? His work. His work, okay? So do we understand the series of events there, right? Yes, yes. Go ahead. Go ahead and explain it to the folks, Sister Dawn. <laughs> um. <laughs> Go ahead. Okay. Um, we, we, we are told that um, when Christ was resurrected, well, he was the Bali. Um, the first grain that came up was the Bali, that the first fruits. The first fruits. The first grain that was was when I had the unleavened bread for the Passover. He was the Passover lamb, and when he was resurrected, he took our, he took some people with him to heaven. And those people we are told from the spirit of prophecy, represent those who were resurrected who will be on the sea of glass. Um, the twenty-four elders are those who represents the unfallen worlds. So when a trumpet is blown, when one trumpet is blown. They know they have to come to have an assembly. It's a means of having an assembly. So they will come together when the trumpet is blown and they'll have an assembly. So when Christ heard the trumpet blowing, he was, he was ascended to heaven and he went into it. A retinue of, um, when they saw him coming, they opened, the, the portals were open and there was a great praise and rejoicing when they saw, when they saw him coming up to heaven. Uh -huh. Receive. His, his coronation. But before he did that, he had to go into his father and he showed his father the, the prince in his hand at his side and what he had gotten, the victory he had won because of us. Uh -huh. Now we were dealing with the fact, remember we were, were last dealing with the fact that when after the thousand years, we have two people on this planet that, that qualify to be the elder. Who are the two? Who do we say that when when he came back here, Sister uh, Sister Brenda? Who do we say we have? Christ, he's the elder, and we have Adam, who's the elder. Correct. Yes, you have Adam and Christ. Remember, we started reading about Sister Brenda. Remember, we were reading about the dead, right? and how we should look forward to what? But I just, Sister Daphne has been up for a little while. Oh, go ahead, Sister Daphne. Sorry, Sister Daphne. Did you unmute her? Yes, yeah, she could go ahead. Good morning, everyone. Um, Good morning. Daphne? Brother Elijah, I have several questions. Oh. And, um, Go ahead, Sister Daphne. Okay. The first one is, um, are you saying that everyone is going to die? Well, no, I said everyone must purpose in their heart that they are willing to what? To die, right? Okay. okay. Let's look at the first. Where do we find this brought out in the first five books, Sister Daphne? Where it's brought out in the first five books? Mm -hmm. In the first five books, we are taught that lesson. And you, you say that because of the death of um, Abel? No. Abel was willing to die, and we see him die. But then we see the 
other principle too that you and I, even though they're going to, even though Enoch was translated, he was still willing to what? He was willing to die. And where do we find that lesson? What that principle being shown? Go over there to Genesis. 22 verse uh, uh, 8, what, 8, 9, 10, 11, and 12. Go to Genesis 22. Genesis 22, 8 and 9, you said? Yeah, 8, 9. Yeah, uh-huh. And Abraham said, my son, God will provide himself a lamb for a burnt offering. So they went both of them together. And they came to a place which God had told him. Of. And Abraham built an altar there and laid the wood in order and found Isaac, his son, and laid him on the altar upon the wood. Now, no, now notice here, Sister Daphne. When did God tell Abraham to go and kill Isaac? Go back to the beginning uh, of Genesis 22. Go to Genesis 22, verse 1. And it came to pass after these things that God did tempt Abraham and said unto him, Abraham, and he said, Behold, there I am. And he said, take now thy son, thine only son Isaac, whom thou lovest, and make thee into the land, uh, sorry, and get thee into the land of Moriah, and offer him there for a burnt offering upon one of the mountains, which I will tell thee of. Okay, now notice in here, God tells Abraham to do something. Does he tell Isaac what Abraham is going to do, sister Daphne. No, he didn't. Now remember, now keep reading. So Abraham, Isaac, and the two servants, they travel for how many days? Um, I think they travel for three days. No, they travel for three days, okay? Mm -hmm. Because keep on reading down a little bit further. Um, and Abraham rose up early in the morning and saddled his ass and took two of his young men with him and Isaac his son and cleaved the wood for the burnt offering and rose up and went into sorry and went unto the place of which God had told him then on the third day Abraham lifted up his eyes Okay. Place of far off, but I did say three days. Oh, I oh I thought you said something else. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. I, <laughs> it was three days. Okay, I, I misunderstood you. Keep going, Sister Daphne. And Abraham said unto his men, "Abide ye there with the ass, and I am the lad. And I and the lad will go yonder and worship, and come again to you." And Abraham took the wood off the burnt off offering and laid it upon Isaac, his son. And he took the fire now, in his why hand. Do, now, why does he lay it upon Isaac, Sister Daphne? Why he laid the wood upon Isaac? Mm -hmm. Because he was going to be the burnt offering. He At this time. the sacrifice. At this time, does Isaac know this? No, he, he didn't. He didn't know this. Keep on reading. And they went both of them together. And Isaac spake unto Abraham, his father, and said, my father. No, now notice he lays the wood and who takes the knife in his hand? Um... The father, okay, Abraham takes the knife and he takes the fire, right? 
Yes. The knife is indicative of who's going to take his life. Abraham is going to take the life of his son. And Abraham is the, represents the father, correct? Yes. So let's say, let's put you in his sister Daphne. He, he lays the wood on your what? Shoulder, okay? He yes. takes the knife in his hand, okay? Now, Isaac and Abraham, they go on a little bit further, right? Yes. Keep on going. Okay. Um, but I still don't see that as because. Well, well let's let the scriptures go for it. Okay. Let's go. Keep reading. And Isaac spake unto Abraham, his father, and said, my father. And he said, here am I, my son. And he said, behold, the fire and the wood. But where is the lamb for a burnt mm -hmm. offering? And Abraham said, my And notice, notice Isaac says, well, where is this lamb? Where is this substitute? Where is this substitute, Lord? Mm -hmm. Keep on going, Sister Daphne. And, I'm, and Abraham said, my son, God will provide himself a lamb for a burnt offering. Mm -hmm. So they went, they went and both of them together. Mm -hmm. And they came to a place which God had told him of. And now, how many, now, how many people go? Abraham and Isaac, do, does the two servants go with him? No. Now, remember, according to Psalms 23rd, the only person that can walk with you and I into the shadow of death is who? Christ. Our friends, relatives, husband, wife, children cannot walk. Now, notice. The two of them are walking what? Together. Now remember, Isaac has the wood on his what? Shoulder. Abraham has the knife and the fire in his what? In his hand. Now go ahead, they walk. Keep going. And... They came to the place which God had told him of. Now, sometime in your life and in my life, you and I are going to come to the what, Sister Daphne? To the place, okay? Now, go over there to Romans, the 12th chapter, Sister Daphne. Then we're going to come back over here, okay? Go to Romans, the 12th chapter, verse 1. Okay, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice. Holy oh, unto God. now present your body a what? A living sacrifice. Okay, now let's go back over to Genesis 22. Abraham and Isaac walk together. Abraham builds the altar. And Isaac has to make a decision to present himself a what, Sister Daphne? Um, well, I guess that's what you're trying to say, but I don't see that because Isaac didn't know that he was going to be a living sacrifice. So I wouldn't say that he was going to present himself as a living but, sacrifice. But at some point, Isaac had to recognize that he had to become a what? A living sacrifice? Yes, ma'am. Didn't he have to recognize that when he got to the place and Abraham, remember reading, and Abraham told him, and you have it. See, we never think about what Isaac went through. Now, your reading assignment today, you have the book, uh, Patriots and Prophets? Yes, I have it. There's a chapter called The Test of What? faith 
And in it, in this chapter, if you open it up and read it, it says when they got to the place, Mount Moriah, that then the Holy Spirit impressed Abraham to tell Isaac what was going to happen. And when you read this today, Sister Daphne, it's going to say that it was a struggle for who? For Isaac. Which page did you say? Which um, chapter? Chapter called. Let's go. Let me get you the exact chapter of Patriots and Prophets. See, like you, I never, I never looked on, I let, I never looked on this thing, or what Isaac went through, chapter thirteen. Okay, um, okay, I would, I agree that we all should be willing to die, but my question was, will everyone die? That's my question. No, no. Remember, I, I said. Looking. No, remember, I said that everyone has to accept the fact that we are entitled to what? To die? To death. First of all, Sister Daphne, are you a sinner? Yes. The wages of sin, the wages of sin is what? Death. So don't we have to accept that we deserve to what? Well, I guess, yeah, we deserve to die. Okay. You, now always remember, you're in, there was, when Jesus, in the story with Abraham and Isaac, or when Jesus went to Calvary, how many people went with him? The two thieves, right? Yes. Which thief are you, Sister Daphne? Or are you a thief? Well, um, I'm a sinner. Well, are you? Now remember, two thieves went there with him, right? Which thief are you? Now remember, both are thieves. So the question I asked you, are you a thief? Well, if, you, if you're looking at the... Um, um, both of them, I would say the one that um, repented. Now the, question, now, the question before, are you a thief? Well, I don't think I am. But if you, you're trying to say if I'm a sinner, then yes, I am a sinner saved by grace. Wait a minute. Remember, the thiefing part that takes place here is we find that back in the first five what? First five books. So if you want to find out whether or not you are a thief or not, you have to go back to the first what? The first first five books. Yes. Where in the first five books do we see the first thief? Well, um, the first thief is... Um, well, I guess it's probably in Genesis. It is. And where's the first thief? Well, we can look at, um, I guess, Lucifer. No, 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 no. On this earth. We're talking about people on this earth. The first thief? Uh-huh. Remember, there was a person you're referring to Cain? no he wasn't the first thief remember, remember in genesis chapter three lucifer told someone hey you can thief that fruit off that tree even though you were told not to take the what well, when I said Lucifer, that's what I was referring to that situation. That I no, no, but that I didn't, I didn't make he, told, he told Eve to take the, steal the what? Yeah. 
Isn't that what she did? Didn't she thief that fruit? Well. Or did she just borrow the fruit? <laughs> <laughs> she took the fruit. She stole it oh, because did, he was told did, to leave. He was told now, wait a minute, Sister Daphne. God told her you can have all of this, but over here, don't touch it because it's mine. Yes. When you go touch somebody else's stuff that somebody told you is theirs, what are you doing, Sister Daphne? Yes, you're taking something that does, that doesn't belong to you. It's something that doesn't belong to you. Sister Daphne, I remember I used to go in my mom and dad's bedroom and my dad would leave, you know, nickels and dimes, you know, on the dresser. And guess what I would do, Sister Daphne? You would go and take it? I would go and thief it. Because I didn't, and, and, and see, there was a difference between me asking my mom and dad about my dad and mom for a nickel or a dime to go buy something. And there was a difference in my going in there, taking it when they had not given me what? Permission, okay? Isn't that true, Sister Daphne? Okay. So I would go and thief from my mama and daddy. I take a nickel or a dime. You know, because back back then when I was growing up, you could buy soda for a nickel, and, you know, and candy bar. So I take at least a dime, you know, buy a soda and a candy bar, okay? And I would thief it. So with Jesus, there are two thieves. One thief says, I don't deserve to what? Did I? The other thief, notice what does he say? And this is why I'm talking to you. See, I'm a thief talking to you, a what? You see? Yeah. Because notice the other thief says, my friend, we, what? What did he say? We deserve to what? To die. Isn't that what he said? Well, I guess. Well, well, you have to move beyond guessing and you must <laughs> deal with the fact that if you are a thief, then we both deserve to what? To die. To die. I mean, and if you put it that way, but I don't see it in that, that way. But um, we all, like you said, we, we deserve to die. We deserve to to die because of our sinful nature. No, no, um, no, not, okay, because can, of, gonna... not because of your sinful nature, because remember Jesus had a what? Jesus had a sinful nature just like you did and I do, but he never chose to yield to the what? He didn't yield to sin, but... Um... I guess that's another time. Um, we can look at that in an, at another time because I have yeah. several more questions. Okay. Well, so therefore, that's where you are, you and I are right now. Because see, at one time I was just like you. I say I don't deserve to what? <laughs> I want to no, be true. I, I am not saying I don't deserve to die. I just wanted to uh, and then um you answered oh, no, the question. Remember, I just wanted now, to, uh, now remember, remember what I was saying to you. I said I was just like you. And I said, I don't deserve to what? Yeah, I, I didn't say what you said, okay? <laughs> okay. I, I can't say anything for you. All I was saying, I was just like you. And I wanted to be translated because I didn't want to what? Didn't want to die. I didn't want to die. And I truly believe that the plan of salvation was supposed to keep me from what? Dying. From dying. So then if you go over here to 
if you go over here to uh, the, the chapter called, thir let's go to chapter 13, because we're going to read about the situation of Isaac. So let's go over here to chapter 13. Okay, chapter 13 in Genesis. Remember, I have other questions and I don't want to take oh, yeah. it. Don't worry, sister, sister, we're gonna we're gonna answer your question. So you just just be at peace, okay? Because okay. see, this this is a struggle that I had to go through. Because see, in the year 2000, they told me I had fourth stage what? Lung cancer, okay. And and I was and I'm a medical missionary, so I had done everything that you know, all the herbs, and fasting, cleansing, and everything, until it got to the point where I was just so weak, you know, I didn't know I had what what they were told me. So I had actually called the elders in, you know, because the Bible says just before you're supposed to die, you're supposed to call the elders in and so forth for anointing. All right. So the next thing that happened, evidently, I was so I was so out of my mind that I don't remember this. Every day they took me to the hospital and uh, they did everything and they told me that they told my wife, you know, I had fourth stage lung cancer. So at that point, I'm sitting there in the hospital and all of a sudden my mind just become as clear as it is clear today. Now I couldn't get up, I couldn't move or anything like that. And they're, they're asking my wife would she sign authorization for them to start me on what chemotherapy and radiation. And, and basically uh, that's when he had to clear my mind up and uh, help me to speak to the doctors because I do not believe that chemotherapy and radiation can cure cancer or anything like that. But here I was in a situation where the doctors is telling my wife that if this doesn't start, uh, then I have about, you know, maybe... 45 to 90 days to live, if that, okay? So finally, the Lord helped me to talk to the doctors and talk to my wife, and they finally realized that, well, he's of a sound mind because if, if you're not, if they don't know you're of a sound mind, then they have somebody else to authorize them to stop uh, treatments. So when I, I talked to the doctors, and they come to me, boy, well, Mr. Rainey, you know, if we don't start this, you know, you're going to die. And if you start this, there may be hope that you'll continue to live. So as I'm there, and I'd always told people about this thing, you know, trusting God and walking through the valley of the shadow of death. But here was my opportunity to deal with this. They're telling me that in 45 to 90 days, I'm going to be dead from fourth stage lung cancer. And early on in my life, I had smoked cigarettes and so forth like that, okay? So it was an acceptable conclusion that was going on. So as I'm dealing with this hope, you know, they're offering me a hope over here that if I start chemotherapy and radiation that they might be able to help me live a little bit longer. So I'm at a point where I have to make a decision. Am I going to practice or put into practice that which I've told other people about trusting God even as we face death? Or am I going to try to escape this death and dying that I'm being told about? And by the grace of God, the Lord helps me to tell the doctor First of all, tell a doctor, I know you mean me well and, and that you want to save my life and whatever. But I truly believe, because they were going to override my uh, decision because they were still saying that I wasn't really thinking straight, okay? 
And then finally I had to tell him, I said, doctor, really, I believe in a certain thing. And they said, what? Because see, they do respect your religious beliefs when you're in the hospital, okay? And I said, I believe that it is God who gave me life. He decided when I was to come into existence or life. And I believe that it should be God's prerogative when I do what? When I die. Is that not true, Sister Daphne? Yes, it is. <laughs> so as I'm talking to this doctor, he's looking at me. He says, do you really believe that, Mr. Rainey? I said, yes. So I said to the doctor, and I asked the Lord to help me to speak to him, you know, as kindly as possible. And I say, I know you really are concerned about me and you really want to do what you want to do to save my life, okay? And I appreciate your efforts and your desire. But since I believe this way, that that is a decision that is not in your hands or in my hands, I believe that that is a decision that we should leave in whose hands, Sister Daphne? God's hand. God's hand. Now, notice I told him, I don't think it's in my hand. I don't think it's in hand. Because the doctors really truly believe that they have that decision-making capacity. And I said, would you <laughs> allow me to trust God in determining whether or not I should live or what? Or die. And he said, you you actually believe this? He, he was dumbfounded because he was talking to me. And I saw he was a very sincere person. I said, yes. I said, really? And Sister Daphne, he said, okay, Mr. Rainey. <laughs> I'll respect your what? your decision okay and at that point sister daphne i really believe that i was going to what to die. To die. i never i had never been in a position like that before sister daphne this was this was a place <laughs> that i never wanted to go to and i never wanted to it wasn't me who did it. It was only God who taught me to do this thing. And that was in the year of what, Sister Daphne? That was in the year 2000, okay? That was 20, how many years ago? 22 years. That was 22 years ago. I was told that I had 45 to 90 days to live. And that I had four stage what? Cancer. Okay. And 22 years later, I can share my testimony with you. And if you notice what I'm saying, I had to go through dealing with the fact that I did not want to die. Now, now, now let's go over here to page uh 148 and I want you to read about what happened with Isaac in this situation 148 of which um, Patriots and Prophets What's the caption? Uh, okay, let's. Uh, okay, let's start right here. Actually, let's start with one. Are you gonna go back and read the whole chapter? Let's start with one fifty one point two. Side by side, the father and what? One fifty one point two. One fifty one point two.
It says, side by side, the father and the son journeyed in silence. Yes, side by side, the father and the son journeyed in silence. The patriarch, pondering his heavy secret, had no heart for words. His thoughts were of the proud found mother and the day when he should return to her alone. Well, he knew that the knife would pierce the heart when it took the life of his son. Go ahead, keep reading. That day, the longest that day, the longest that Abraham had ever experienced dragged mm -hmm. slowly to its close. While his son and the young man were sleeping, he went the night in prayer, still hoping that some heavenly messenger might come to say that the trial was enough, that the youth might mm -hmm. return unharmed to his mother. But no relief came to his tortured soul. Another long day, another night of humiliation and prayer. While ever the command that was to leave him childless was ringing in his ears. Satan was near to whisper doubts and unbelief, but Abraham resisted his suggestions. As they were about to begin the journey of the third day, the patriarch, looking north, saw the promised sun, a cloud of glory hovering over Mount Moriah. And he knew that the voice which had spoken to him was from heaven. Even now, he did not murmur against God, but strengthening his soul by dwelling upon the evidences of the Lord's goodness and faithfulness. This son had been unexpected, unexpectedly given and had not he who bestowed the precious gift, a right to recall his own. Then fate repeated the promise, in Isaac shall thy seed be called, the seed numberless of the grains of sand upon the shore. Isaac was the child of a miracle and could not the power that gave him life restore it. Looking beyond that was Sorry, looking beyond that which was seen, Abraham grasped the divine word, accounting that God was able to raise him up even from the dead. Keep going. Yet none but God could understand how great was the father's sacrifice in yielding up his son to death. Abraham desired that none but God should witness the parting scene. He bade his servants remain behind, saying, I and the lad will go yonder and worship and come again to you. The wood was laid upon Isaac, the one to be offered. The father took the knife and the fire, and together they ascend toward the mountain summit. The young man silent, silently wondering whence, so far from folds and flock, the offering was to come. At last he spoke, my father, behold the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for a burnt offering? Oh, what a test was this, how the endeavoring words, my father, passed Abraham's heart. Not yet, he could not tell him now. My son, he said, God will provide himself a lamb for a burnt offering. At the appointed place, they built the altar and laid the wood upon it. Then with trembling voice, Abraham unfolded to his son the divine message. It was with terror and amazement that Isaac learned his fate, but he offered no resistance. He could have escaped his doom. 
had he chosen to do so. The grief-stricken old man, exhausted with the struggle of those three terrible days, could not have opposed the will of the vigorous youth. But Isaac had been trained from childhood to ready, trusting obedience, and as the purpose of God was opened before him, he yielded a willing submission. He was a sharer in Abraham's faith, and he felt that he was honored in being called to give his life <laughs> as an offering. And wait a minute, sister, sister Daphne. It says Isaac felt that he was what? Given an honor. An honor to lay down his what? His life. See, we are not taught that we are to look forward to laying down our life at God's appointed what? All right his appointed time for us. In essence, we want to escape laying down our what? Our lives. <clears throat> when I read this, Sister Daphne, I could not believe this. Because see, I had the picture in my mind of Isaac being, you know, this young little 12, 13 year old boy. See, I didn't even know that Isaac was the big grown what? Mine. And that's why when it read, he says, Isaac didn't have to get on that altar now. Keep reading. Okay. Um, but I get your point, you know. Um. <laughs> now, I want you to, no, I don't want you, I want you to, because see, when I went through this experience, I'm just saying the experience I went through, and look what it says next. He, what? Look what he did next. Okay, but I stick with strain. Okay. He, he what? He was now, a sharer in Abraham's faith, and he felt that he was honored in being called to give his life as an offering to God. He tenderly seeks to lighten the father's grief and encourages his nerveless hands to bind the cords that wow. bind him to. Look what look what Isaac did. See, I had never thought about Isaac. You know, I'd always been focusing on Abraham. Abraham, he says Elijah. The test of faith was not on You're breaking up. For Isaac, but it was Abraham, but it was also for what? Not only for Abraham. But the test of faith was also for who? For Isaac. For Isaac. So that's when you read about Romans 12. Isaac was willing to present himself a dead sacrifice or a living what? A living sacrifice. So I said, wait a minute. So this is what Paul was talking about? So Isaac was willing to get on that altar and Isaac had already purpose in his mind that he was already what sister definitely he was dead Isaac did not see himself coming down off of Mount Moriah that day because he had already purpose that he was going to do what sister Daphne Purpose in his heart that he was going to die. <laughs> Sister Daphne, I said, wait a minute. That was a hard saying, Sister Daphne. Then he showed me something. He says, Elijah, should Isaac have not purposed in his heart that he was going to die? Then he opened up something. He says, notice Elijah. I did not introduce the lamb 
until Isaac had already purposed. What, Sister Daphne? That he was going to die. I said, wait a minute. So you have to accept death before he can introduce the what? The substitute. I said, I didn't know that. I just thought that once you accept Jesus as you say, really, beep. he says, Elijah, no, you, you're, you're using Jesus to get out of dying. He says, but notice Jesus' example was that he was willing to die. And you must be willing to follow his footsteps and be willing to lay down while you're living now a living sacrifice, you must be willing to say, Father, I deserve to what? Mm. And into your hands, I commend my life and you will do what you deem best. That's what the thief on the cross said. He says, Elijah, notice the thief on the, one of the thieves says, we deserve to die. And he looked at Jesus. He says, Lord, just remember me. He didn't say, I don't, I really, since I, since I, uh, I admitted that, uh, I can get out of it. You know, like a lot of times they call jailhouse confession just before the person gets ready to be put to death. Oh, yes, I did it. And they want to really escape the death penalty. But God is saying, I want to teach you how to accept responsibility and then also be willing to accept the consequences of your sin, which is death. And see, Sister Daphne, that's the thing that Lucifer didn't want to do. Lucifer to this day truly believes that God treated him unjustly, unfairly, and doing what he did. He will not deal with the fact that, yes, he deserves to die, and the wages and that the death penalty is much an act of love as anything else. God will, out of love, put Lucifer to death, okay? So that's why, if you notice, and this is your assignment for today, that can read this chapter here called The Test of Faith, because it opened up to me a whole line of reasoning that I had never even considered because I'd never thought about Isaac and uh, how Isaac did these things, okay? And what Isaac went through. And Sister Daphne, whoo, Isaac was a happy camper at the end of that day when that lamb was introduced and, uh, and they put that lamb on that altar rather than Isaac laying down his life that day, okay? And this is what it talks about in Psalms 23. Isaac walked through the valley of the shadow of death, and he went into it without fearing any what, Sister Daphne? Any evil, okay? All right, so you can go. <clears throat> now, what was the next question, Sister Daphne? Okay, um, <laughs> um, my question is regarding the 24 elders, and I think when you ask Sister Dawn to sum it up, because I wasn't sure if I heard correctly, but listening to her, you're saying that the 24 elders are the um, the 24 elders are the uh, the um, unfallen world and well, um, I I am um, looking at from so are you are you saying that the 24 elders are those who are um, the um, and the unfallen world. Well, well, now before you get to that point, remember the twenty-four elders. We the first time 
you come in contact with the 24 elders or in the book of Revelation, right? Revelation, the fourth chapter, fourth and the fifth chapter, correct? Yes. But if you see 24 elders over here in Revelation, then you should find the foundational principle or concept over where, Sister Daphne? In the, we should, if you see 24 elders over in the book of Revelation, you should be able to find the foundational principles of how God wants us to think about elders in the first five books, right? Um, that's not my understanding, but um, no, I'll, no. Go along with, I'll go along oh, with you. If you find something over in the New Testament, it's supposed to have its beginning roots in the what? In the Old Testament, I would say okay. that. All right. So where in the, the, the book of the law, that's the, the foundational principles. The first five books of Moses is called the law or the Torah. Yeah. So where in the first five books do we find the principle pertaining to what an elder and what this whole thing about elders, because if you notice around God's throne, you don't see 24 deacons, you don't see 24 pastors, you don't see 24 bishops, you see 24 what? You see 24 elders, but... Um... So what are the 24 elders about? What is the purpose of the 24 elders? They are a part of the judicial... Um, um seen in in in, um, in heaven mm -hmm. so what so what he had me do because see i was taught that the 24 elders are those that were resurrected with christ and he took them back to heaven and that's where the 24 elders came in yes but then that's my understanding too because that's in the spirit of prophecy um, where the, those 24 elders, Jesus, when he present them to the Father, uh, him and them as the wave sheep. That's the wave sheep. Right. Yeah, the but, representation of the first fruit. True. So I, I, but see, you, you correctly said it. They are the wave sheets. But see, the wave sheets and the 24 elders are not the same. The spirit of prophecy doesn't. I said, wait a minute. This doesn't say that those taken back to heaven are the 24 elders, it says that they are the wave sheep. So therefore, I said, then, see, then the Lord said to my mind, Elijah, you've never studied out the principle pertaining to the elders. And I had never done that before. There are about, there's one, two, three, four. If you look in our Adventist literature, there's about four or five different concepts pertaining to the 24 elders. Uh, one concept is that they are those taken back with Christ. Another concept is that they represent the 12 patriarchs and the 12 apostles. Another concept is that they're, rep they're angels. And then they, I think there's one other, two, two other more. And out of those four or five different concepts, we said, well, this one about Christ taking them back to heaven, that is the one we accept. But, and I, see, I thought that this was something that we came up with, but this is, this is a concept that is taught in the Protestant world. See, the other churches believe the same way we believe. So if when you, and this is where you have to go back and study out. And when I went back to study out the concept of elders, in the first five books. When, when Moses went in before Pharaoh in the book of Exodus, the fourth chapter, who went in before Pharaoh with him, Sister Daphne? When Moses went before um, Aaron. Okay. I, I said the same thing you did. He says, so, so he says, Elijah, go back. You see, the Lord will give you little reading assignments. And that's why if you notice, I'm pushing you back to where he had me to read to help me to understand. Now let's go back here to uh, Exodus, the 
the third chapter to see whether or not the scriptures support that position, okay? Let's go to Exodus, the third chapter. You got Exodus, the third chapter? Hold on. Okay, Exodus chapter three. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> okay, you want me to read from the beginning? Okay, what does it say in Exodus, the third chapter? It started with verse uh, 14, 15, 16. Read, read what it says there. <clears throat> And God said unto Moses, I am that I am. And he said, thus shall thou say unto the children of Israel, I am hath sent me unto you. And God said moreover unto Moses, thus shall thou say unto the children of Israel, the Lord God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, God of Isaac and the God of Jacob has sent me unto you. This is my name forever, and this is my memorial unto all generations. Go and gather the elders of Israel together and say unto them, The Lord God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, of Isaac, and of Jacob, appeared unto me, saying, I have surely visited you and seen that which is done to you in Egypt. And I have said, I will bring you up out of the affliction of Egypt unto the land of the Canaanites and the Hittites and the Amorites and the Jebusites and the Hevites and the Jebusites unto a land flowing with milk and honey. And they shall hearken to the voice, and thou shalt come, thou and the elders of Israel, unto the king of Egypt, and ye shall say unto him, The Lord God of the Hebrews hath met with us, and now let okay. us go. Okay, now notice here, Sister Daphne, Moses is commanded to bring who in before Pharaoh? The king of Egypt? The elders. <clears throat> Sister Daphne, I did not even know it. He says, Elijah. I said, well, wait a minute. I thought it was just Aaron. He says, Elijah, that's because you did not read the scriptures. It says right here that when I told Moses to go in before Pharaoh initially, I told him to bring who? The elders. <clears throat> yep. Yeah. I said, well, what is this whole thing about the elders? Now, you remember, so, so when he had to clear that up in my mind, I said, well, what did I, he says, you got that concept from reading the Ten Commandments, you're watching the movie, you call the Ten Commandments with Charlton Heston, because you just see Moses and Aaron. He says, Elijah, yes, at some point, Moses did take Aaron, but initially he took the elders in. So I said, well, what is this elder thing all about? Then he reminded me, do you know when the Seventh-day Adventist church was set up, all of the ministers were called pastors or they were called elder sister Daphne? Elders? <laughs> they sure were. Elder James White. In all our literature is always Elder James White, Elder yeah. A.T. Jones. Elder E.J. Wagner, the General Conference President was called Elder G.I. Butler, Elder Daniels, and Sister Daphne. I remember growing up in the Adventist church, we never called the minister pastor. We called him elder. It was Elder C.D. Brooks. It was Junior. It was Elder Britton. And even when I was at Oakwood in the 70s, 
seventies and oh, well, I went there in the late seventies and eighties. All of the ministry, we always called him Elder Ward, Elder E.E. E. Cleveland. And then it was like, wait a minute. When did we start calling the ministers pastors rather than what? Elders. So then that led me on this whole study about what are the elders? What was the purpose of God doing that with the Adventist church? Now, now we've got to the point where the elders and the ministers are not the same. In fact, I remember growing up, all the ministers were called elders. And the elders would speak, you know, different elders would speak different Sabbaths and so forth like that. Do you remember that, Sister Daphne? When I came into the church, they <clears throat> it was pastors and elders. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. But I remember growing up, they were just elders. And then he reminded me, he says, if you notice from the other fallen Protestant churches, you don't hear nothing about the elders. You hear all you hear about the reverend, the bishop, you know, something like that. But you don't have anything about the elders in the churches. Uh, and when you go to the Catholic church, you don't hear anything about elders either. So that led me down to study because I had a good friend of mine call me. And he sits on one of the conference board and he was talking about this whole thing about whether or not women should be ordained as elders or pastors and so forth. So we were dealing with that. So I had never really searched out to try to find out what is this thing about the elders all about, you know. And what will it happen? I know we got to quit now because it's going on 7.30. We went over longer than we were supposed to. And we can continue this on about the elder sister Daphne and finish answering your question from the Bible and how we were supposed to understand the office and the position of the elders in the church. And uh, that would help us to understand this whole push by the enemy to change God's order and so forth like that, okay? So now you see that Moses was told to take who in there with him? To take the elders, right? So, Sister Daphne? Hello, Sister Daphne? Okay, sorry, I was muted. Oh, okay. So, basically, we're going to have to continue on because it's after 7.30, going on 8 o'clock, and I know that Others have responsibilities and duties, and we can continue this on, Sister Daphne, okay? But I wanted you to read that, read that chapter called The Test of Faith. That's your reading assignment until we get together again, okay? Okay, and um, I would really like for us to look at this. Um, the, um, to look at what? Of, yes, the 24 elders. So I guess when we meet again, we can discuss. Yeah. We'll, we'll, we'll pick that up, Sister Daphne. Oh, yeah, because I had to really go through this, and that was a real struggle dealing with this thing and, and finding out, based upon the Bible and the spirit of prophecy, how, we, how were we supposed to think about this situation? And we will continue this in our next one. Okay, Sister? Yes. Okay. All right. Were there any more questions or comments before we leave for this morning? Anyone? Yes. Okay, no questions or comments, Brother Vinny? Sister Don? Yes, I hear. I'm here. You could close off. Yeah, you could pray. Okay, we'll go ahead and close up. Sister, uh, go ahead, Sister Daphne. Would you close out for us, please?
Yes, let us pray. Our Father and our God, as we come before you again, we thank you for health and strength. We thank you for your word. Lord, we see where we have to study your word to show ourselves approved. We have to hear a little, there a little, and we just ask that you continue to be with us, that as believers, that we may continue to seek you in spirit and in truth. We ask that you be with each and every one of us as we go throughout the day, as we prepare for your holy Sabbath, that we may do everything in decency and in order. We thank you, we praise you, we give you all the honor and all the glory. For this is our prayer in Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. Amen. Amen, everyone. Have a good day. See you all later.